Good evening. We are on Sunday, the first Sunday in Lent. It's the 26th of February, 2023. My second daughter's birthday is tomorrow. Happy birthday, Marianne, for tomorrow. She was born in 1966. That makes me feel quite old. I'll just begin with just a couple of prayers. I'm going to be sharing with you something interesting. Excuse me can't get rid of this cold doesn't want to leave in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen O angel of god my guardian dear to whom god's love commits me here ever this night be at my side to light to guard to rule and guide amen prayer to saint michael the archangel defend us in the day of battle be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do you, O Prince, the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl through the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. I'm going to be sharing with you an old document many years ago the Catholic Church and Anglican Orders Francis Clark SJ from the London Catholic Truth Society Professor of Dogmatic Theology at Haythrop College the London Catholic Truth Society the introduction page 5 the Origins of the Anglican Ordination Rite, page 8. 2. The Catholic Rejection of Edwardine Ordinations During the Marianne Restoration, page 12. Part 3. The Establishment of the Elizabethan Hierarchy, page 15. Page 4. Significant events of the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, page 16. 5. The Bull Apostolicae Curae of 1896. A. The Preliminary Discussions and the Final Decision of Pope Leo XIII, page 18. The Defect of Form B, page 20. C. The Defect of Intention, 25, and D. The Dogmatic and Canonical Force of the Holy See's Decision, page 28, and 6. Development since 1896, page 30. So that's what I'm going to be sharing with you. And I will read the introduction. The Catholic Church and Anglican Orders. I feel this is very important because there's a lot going in on in, in the Anglican Church as I will be reading this and I think it's very important for us to know and understand the history of both because once we were at one Introduction. The Catholic Church teaches that when her priests are ordained, they are given special supernatural powers. Chief among these is the power to bring about the real objective presence of Jesus Christ by the Eucharistic consecration, together with the power to offer to God true propitiatory sacrifice in the Mass. Through the sacrament of holy order, these sacerdotal powers have been passed on all through the centuries of Christian history by the bishops of the Church, who are the successors of the Apostles, 
and who have received from them a share in the high priesthood of Christ. The Catholic Church acknowledges that in the Eastern Orthodox Churches, even though separated from the unity of her one fold, the essentials of the sacrament of order have been preserved and that consequently there is still a valid succession of sacerdotal ordinations in those churches. But in the judgment of the Catholic Church, authoritatively declared by Pope Leo XIII in the bull Apostolic High Curie of 1896, the ordinations of the Anglican Church are not sacramentally valid in this sense. That is, they do not confer upon the Anglican clergy those special sacerdotal powers. This judgment must not be misunderstood. It is not meant as an attack on the Church of England, nor does it imply any condemnation or of all lack of charity towards the Anglican clergy. Catholics respect the Anglican bishops and clergymen as religious leaders and teachers who have dedicated their lives to God, who have been commissioned by their church to be Christian ministers, to preach the truths of scripture, to baptise their people and to lead them in worship and in the way of virtue. We have no thought of belittling the value of the ministry of those devoted men within their own communion. And indeed, it would be quite out of place for us to pass any judgment on that subject. So to we respect the ministers of the free churches and of other Christian bodies, <coughs> excuse me, and we are thankful for the help and example given to us by the noble Christian lives of so many of our separated brethren. No one questions that Anglican ordinations are perfectly effective for ordaining ministers of the Anglican Church. It is only when the claim is made that Anglican ordination confers the special sacerdotal powers of the Catholic priesthood that the Catholic Church as the guardian of her own sacraments and the interpreter of her dogmatic teaching finds it necessary to point out that the claim is inadmissible. It is only one section among the Anglicans, those of the Anglo-Catholic wing, who make that claim. The others, <coughs> excuse me, who are faithful to the authorised belief of the Church of England and of the great majority of its members ever since the Reformation 
readily agree with the Pope that their church does not bestow upon its clergy the power of the consecrating and sacrificing priesthood which according to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is conferred by the sacrament of holy orders. They regard such teaching as an error and they insist that they have no desire to be considered priests in that sense. The Anglo-Catholics however, keenly resent Rome's decision, which has practical repercussions, not only in England, but also in many other parts of the world. With a devout appreciation of Catholic Eucharistic piety and of the Catholic doctrine of the priesthood, they regard the Holy See's adverse judgment on their orders as a denial of the reality of what they hold to be the very springs of their spiritual life. Moreover, the question is a recurring source of anxiety of conscience for individual Anglo-Catholics, some of whom find peace of soul in the end only by entering the Roman Catholic Church. A leading Anglo-Catholic author has feelingly expressed this painful dilemma. And there's a footnote Countless testimonies to this effect could be quoted from the writings of Anglican bishops and divines. To cite one example, the Reverend Dr. Geoffrey Lamp, Ely Professor of Divinity in the University of Cambridge, writes that the loyal Anglican should be thankful that his orders are not valid in the sense of Roman Catholic theology. The churchman <clears throat> March 1962, pages 22 to 30. Introduction Where the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist is accepted, there the Catholic doctrine of the priesthood is a logical and absolute necessity. No orders, no Eucharist. Once that question has been raised, we are bound to find a sufficient answer to it or in very loyalty to our own church to leave it. We Anglicans cannot just ignore apostolicae curiae, if only because it puts us as Anglicans in such a very awkward dilemma. If the Pope was right about the facts, and at the bottom the notes, Gregory Dix, The Question of Anglican Orders, New Edition, 1956, page 33, the polemical tract entitled Infallible Fallacies, SPCK, 2nd Edition, 1958. I was 12 which boldly claims to disprove the Roman Catholic case against Anglican orders, hardly calls for a serious reply. In view of its wide circulation, however, some of its main misconceptions will be noted below. While confidently refuting arguments the Pope does not use, its authors quite fail to meet or even to grasp the force of the arguments he does use. Continuing. The question of Anglican orders is, then, no mere academic debate, 
not only does it concern theological issues of serious importance, but it also touches the most heartfelt convictions of many of our separated brethren. It therefore demands reverence and sympathy in our minds as we discuss it, even though we have to set out the facts frankly and objectively. Unfortunately, so much confusion has been introduced into this discussion in the past that now it is often difficult for the ordinary inquirer to gain a clear idea of what it is all about. Since the publication of Pope Leo's decision, scores of works have been written attacking it, but through failure to appreciate the background of Catholic sacramental theology necessary for an accurate interpretation of the Pope's bull. Almost all of these attacks have been misdirected. For instance, the widely read book of Dom Gregory Dix, The Question of Anglican Orders, is a work of courteous controversy and much erudition, but it is practically all beside the point. Some knowledge of the relevant facts of history and theology is indeed required before one can appreciate what the real point is. But the ultimate issue is simple and certain. In order to keep it clearly in view and to prevent it from being obscured in a fog of controversy, it is well to state it here at the outset in one paragraph. The central and decisive reason why the Catholic Church judges that Anglican ordination, ordinations plural, do not confer the sacerdotal powers of the Catholic priesthood is as follows. A sacrament of the Catholic Church is a sacred sign which by divine power is made an effective instrument for bestowing God's gifts and grace upon men. Since the outward sacrament is essentially a sign, it must signify what it effects inwardly. For the sacrament of holy orders, therefore, every valid ordination rite must in some way explicitly or implicitly signify the bestowal of the Catholic sacerdotal office. But the Anglican ordination rite has never signified this, since by it is very origin it was stamped with an anti-sacerdotal significance. What follows is a summary of the historical and theological evidence which provides the background for the Catholic judgment on Anglican orders. 1. The origins of the Anglican ordination rite Although Henry VIII's break with Rome in 1534 severed England from Catholic unity, it had no immediate effect on the sacramental validity of the ordinations 
performed by the English bishops until Henry's death in 1547 and during the earlier years of the reign of his son, Edward VI. The Catholic ordination rite continued in use. Then, in 1550, a new rite, the Edwardino Ordino, was officially substituted for the old. It was in use in England for the remaining three years of Edward's reign, with slight revisions made in 1552. Rejected during the Catholic Restoration under Mary Tudor, 1553 to 1558, it was reintroduced in 1559 and used to institute the new Elizabethan hierarchy from which the succession of Anglican orders descends. It is this ordinal, with some words added in 1662, but with substantially the same significance as when it was first composed. That is still used for ordinations to the Anglican ministry. The Catholic Church has declared that this ordinal was from the beginning and still is incapable of serving as a ritual formulary for the bestowing of her sacrament of holy orders. When settling the question, Pope Leo XIII singled out one factor as of paramount importance. That was the native character and spirit which the Edwardine Ordinal required from the circumstances of its origin. The Pope explained that it was this total signification of the right, its unmistakable link with the Reformation attack against the Catholic doctrine of the priesthood that made it certain that none of the phrases contained in the ordinal, even if neutral in themselves, could signify the sense required for a Catholic sacramental form of ordination. The key to the understanding of the whole question of Anglican orders then lies in an accurate appreciation of the historical setting in which the ordinal was composed. The chief architect of the Protestant Reformation in England during the years 1547 to 1553 was Thomas Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury who carried through a drastic change of religion with the help of a band like-minded churchman and in close collaboration with the civil rulers. Hughes 2, 101-47. He also called in several foreign reformers to assist him in his work among whom the most influential were Martin Busser, Peter Martyr Vermigli and John A. Lasco. Five details in Eucharistic Sacrifice and the Reformation, Chapter 7. As appears clearly from their writings, 
Cranmer and his colleagues were in agreement with Luther, Zwingli, Calvin and all the continental reformers in their detestation of the Catholic doctrine of the Mass and of the sacrificing priesthood. The fundamental reasons for this hostility are to be found in the decisive difference between the Protestant and Catholic doctrines of grace, of justification, of the church and the sacramental system and of the incarnation and the atonement. A study of these reasons makes it abundantly clear why all the reformers both on the continent and in England necessarily rejected the Catholic Mass and sacrificing priesthood. CESR chapters 6 and 8. A theory accepted too trustingly by some Anglo-Catholics that the reformers did not really reject the sacrifice of the Mass itself but only certain corrupt teachings about it has been shown to be simply untrue. It was based on fables and misunderstandings which are easily dispelled by study of the facts. A detailed discussion of these fables and misunderstandings is in ESR chapters 10 to 21. The actual Catholic teaching on the mass current at the time of the Reformation is set out in chapter 5. Cranmer and his party also shared with the Zinwinglians and Calvinists a special reason for repudiating the Catholic belief about the powers of priesthood, namely their denial that any real objective presence of Christ was brought about by the Eucharistic consecration. It is not only what the English reformers believed and taught, not only their fellowship with the continental reformers in the great anti-sacerdotal campaign that fixes the native character and spirit of the Anglican ordination rite, equally significant is the record of what they actually did during the years of Edward's reign. The years which saw the first appearance of the chief formularies of the Church of England. The Book of Common Prayer, which I grew up with because I was a Protestant until an adult, although I went to a Catholic convent, Servite convent in Kings Lynn. I saw I'm familiar with the Book of Common Prayer, the Ordinal and Articles of Religion. The following is a summary of some of the main innovations made during the Edwardine Reformation in order to bring about the overthrow of the Catholic system of faith and order concerning the Eucharist and the priesthood. So for fuller details of these measures, see RMP Part 4 and ESR Chapter 9. As soon as the restraint of Henry VIII's doctrinal convert conservatism was ended by his death in 1547, there was an outburst of radical agitation and propaganda against the mass and the real presence. 
It was obvious to all that the new trend had the active favour of the men now in power. Chantries were suppressed by law in 1547 as favouring vain opinions of purgatory and masses satisfactory. A book of homilies embodying the Reformation doctrine of justification was ordered to be read weekly in the churches. Licenses to preach, controlled by Cranmer, were restricted to those who were hostile to the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist. For protesting against the official authority given to men who do openly and blasphemously talk about against the Mass and against the sacrament, Bishop Gardner of Winchester was imprisoned in the Tower. In 1548, Cranmer and Ridley led the attack on the doctrine of the real presence in a debate of the House of Lords. Can you imagine that debate? Oh, goodness me, we're, we're barely, well, barely anyone in Parliament believes in God now, so I should hope they all join together, whatever their denomination. Then, in 1549 came the momentous change in the liturgy when the first book of common prayer replaced the Catholic Missal and was imposed by the reforming regime for use in public worship despite the reluctance of the Catholic-minded majority who liked their Missal. <laughs> In the New English Communion office, several features were retained that outwardly res resembled the Mass. But as in the new Protestant liturgies on the continent, there was a thorough expunging of all sacrificial language wiped out. After the popular risings, which followed the imposition of the new form of worship, had been crushed, the pace of the religious revolution quickened. Now followed the desecration and the destruction of the altars. Those mute but eloquent witnesses in every church in the land to the age-old belief in the sacrifice of the Mass. Catholic-minded bishops and churchmen who defended the Mass and the old faith were deposed and replaced by zealous partisans of the new. A new confession of faith, the Articles of Religion, was officially authorised. It concluded an article rejecting the Catholic doctrine of the real presence. And I'm speaking of the real presence, the real presence of Jesus Christ in the sacrament. And other condemning the sacrifices of masses as forged fables and dangerous deceits. Cranmer and his assistants were also at work on a new code of ecclesiastical laws, which was to include penal canons against any who should defend the real presence and the mass. In 1552, the second prayer book of Edward VI replaced that of 1549, which had been merely an interim measure the structure of the Eucharistic rite was even more drastically rearranged in order to show, as Busa had put it, that there's nothing in common between us and the Roman Antichrists. 
any ambiguities remaining in the 1549 rite were now removed and the result was an accurate embodiment in the dignified English of which Cranmer was a master of the radical Protestant conception of the Eucharist as opposed to the Catholic doctrine which hasn't changed of the real presence and the Eucharistic sacrifice. How sad for him. It was in the midst of this ferment of religious revolution that the ordinal was composed and brought into use by the Edwardine reformers. It is this historical context that serves to determine beyond doubt the native character and spirit of the Anglican rite. Although some traditional features were retained in the new formulary, everything that in the pre-Reformation rite had expressed the essential consecrating and sacrificing function of the Catholic priesthood was now significantly omitted. The wording of the Anglican ordination forms thus received an objective and unambiguous determination from their whole setting. It was plain to all parties that the new English rite was an instrument to make ministers in the sense of Reformation theology instead of bishops and priests in the sense of Catholic theology. Even though the Anglican ordinal includes neutral expressions which in themselves could be made to bear a Catholic sense, their meaning is permanently coloured by the circumstances of the rite's origin. This objective purport of the ordinal, which in the interests of accuracy and clarity, should not be called an intention, has always been the decisive factor on account of which the Catholic Church has judged the Anglican rite to be defective in form, that is, in sacramental signification. That's the end of part one. We're now moving on to part two. The Catholic rejection of Edwardine ordinations during the Marianne Restoration. The attitude of the Catholic authorities both in Rome and in England during the five years of the Marianne Restoration which followed Edward's reign showed clearly enough what was the contemporary judgment about the native character and spirit of the new English ordination rite? Nine, details in RMP part five and ESR pages 201 to five. As soon as the Protestant regime fell, from power in 1553, there was a swift and general reaction against Cranmer's rights. 
Edwardine ordinations were now denounced as invalid and impious, and bishops and preachers spoke out vehemently against the late counterfeited ministers. A revealing illustration of the attitude of the authorities is provided by this extract from a homily ordered by Bishop Bonner of London to be read publicly in the churches. And this is it. The priest ought both to consecrate and to offer. Therefore, the late made ministers in the time of the schism in their new devised ordination, having no authority at all given them to offer in the mass the body and blood of our Saviour Christ, but both they so ordered, or rather disordered, and their schismatical orderers also, utterly despising and impugning not only the oblation or sacrifice of the Mass, but also the real presence of the body and blood of our Saviour Christ in the sacrament of the altar. Therefore, I say, that all such both damnably and presumptuously did offend against Almighty God, and also most pitifully beguile the people of this realm. Fuller text in RMP 2, 108-9 and the SR, page 203, RMP 2, page 115. In this document of 1554, we already find clearly indicated the theological reason on which the Catholic Church has based her judgment against the Anglican orders from that day to this. Bonner's words point out clearly the decisive effect in the ordinal introduced by the Edwardine reformers. Their new devised ordination, he says, gave no authority at all to the late made ministers to perform the essential sacerdotal function, that is, to consecrate and to offer. Many similar condemnations of Edwardine ordinations are recorded. So Bishop Gardiner of Winchester preaching in St. Paul's before Cardinal Pole and King Philip, just after the reconciliation of England to the Holy See, lamented that in Edward's reign, the priesthood was taken away. And since the new ministers were mere laymen, in a few years, there would have been no clergy left at all. Queen Mary, after seeking Cardinal Pole's advice, had already sent a decree to the bishops in 1554, in which she charged them to be vigilant, touching such persons as were heretofore promoted to any orders after the new sort and fashion of order, considering they were not ordered in very deed. There is, in fact, indisputable evidence of a diligent policy on the part of the Catholic authorities to seek out such men and to disallow their orders. Only a few of the Edwardine clergy were eligible to enter the Catholic priesthood and it is very significant that these men were reordained or rather ordained absolutely according to the Catholic rite. 
records of such reordinations survive from the registers of the dioceses of London, Oxford, Exeter and York. And there's footnotes about them as well. There is much other evidence which tells us in the same sense there is for instance the case of John Taylor who had been consecrated as Bishop of Lincoln by the right of the ordinal in Edward's reign. It is recorded that in Canterbury registers that he was deposed in Mary's reign because his consecration was null. So too the official policy can be seen from the proceedings in the heresy trials. In several cases it is expressly recorded that degradation from their Catholic orders was prescribed for bishops and priests who had been ordained according to the pre-Reformation rite, but not for those ordained with the Edwardine ordinal, whose orders were treated as non-existent. In the light of these and many other similar facts, it is not difficult to recognise the meaning of the bulls of Pope Julius III in 1553 and 1554 and of Pope Paul IV in 1555, giving instructions and faculties to Cardinal Pole, the papal legate, who in his turn delegated the faculties to the English bishops. In these documents, canonical authority is given by the Holy See to Pole and the English bishops for dealing with many difficult ecclesiastical problems, including the case of those who were not validly and lawfully ordained who had been instituted not according to the accustomed form of the church, in whose ordinations the form and intention of the church had not been observed, and whose benefices and orders had been obtained nulliter or invalidly. There is indeed abundant evidence from many independent sources showing plainly that in Mary's reign the Catholic authorities both in England and in Rome deliberately and definited, definitely rejected as invalid ordinations which had been performed in the previous reign by use of the new English rite. Some controversialists, by clutching at a few ambiguities or anomalies in the records, while ignoring the whole mass of proved historical facts which combine to put the matter beyond doubt, still try to maintain the contrary. But in this, they are clinging to a lost cause. That's the end of part two. We're continuing with part three. The establishment of the Elizabethan hierarchy. The Catholic Restoration lasted only five years, ending with Elizabeth's accession to the throne in 1558. The diocesan bishops refusing with common accord to cooperate in the reintroduction of Protestantism 
were then deprived of their sees and almost all imprisoned. None of them could be induced to consecrate Matthew Parker, who was to be the first primate of the new Elizabethan hierarchy. But the government managed to bring together four other prelates of Protestant sympathies to perform the ceremony at Lambeth in December 1559. The presiding minister was William Barlow, who had been bishop of St. David's in the reign of Henry VIII, then of Bath and Wells under Edward VI, and had forfeited his see under Mary. Although all the normal documentary evidence is strangely lacking, it can reasonably be presumed that he had duly received Episcopal consecration. The other three, who assisted at Parker's consecration, were John Hodgkin, a suffragan bishop, who had been validly consecrated in 1537 and John Scorey and Miles Coverdale, who had been made bishops merely by the Edwardine Ordinal. For the consecration of the new Archbishop of Canterbury, from whom the succession of Anglican orders derives, the Edwardine Ordinal of 1552 was reintroduced. In the eyes of the Catholic Church, therefore, the consecration was invalid on account of the use of that defective formulary. In addition to this primary and permanent defect of form found also in all previous and subsequent ordinations in which the Anglican ordinal was used. There was a second nullifying defect in the consecration of Parker. From the circumstances of the Lambeth ceremony in 1559, Pope Leo XIII had sufficient evidence to judge that there was at that time not only defect of form in the right used, but also defect of ministerial intention in the prelates who used it. Now we move on to four. Significant events in of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. The invariable practice of the Catholic Church of treating Anglican orders as null and void and of obtaining afresh converts from the Anglican ministry was continued during Elizabeth's reign and throughout the following centuries. The English government for long kept secret all particulars of Parker's consecration 
And as a result, the Nag's Head fable began to gain currency at the beginning of the 17th century, according to which Parker had received no serious consecration at all, but had been made archbishop in a frivolous manner in a tavern. There had, in fact, been a dinner and convivial gathering at the Nags Head Inn in Cheapside after the routine confirmation of Parker's appointment in Bow Church. That's where they rung the bells and there was a song in London that we used to sing. The, the bells, are, yeah. And it seems that a garbled report of this event eventually furnished the material for the legend, which was widely repeated by Catholic controversialists. The official rejection of Anglican orders by the Catholic authorities in Rome and elsewhere was, of course, independent of this latter legend, but was always based on the fundamental theological objections to the ordinal itself. In 1661 to 62, some modifications were made to the Anglican rite, to the unspecific ordination forms in the 1552 ordinal receive the Holy Ghost, etc. were now added the words for the office and work of a priest or of a bishop from the viewpoint of Catholic theology these additions did not remedy the abiding defect of form in the Anglican rite which continues to this day. From time to time, particular cases concerning Anglican orders were referred for judgment to the Holy See, always with the same result. In 1684 to 85, the case of a young convert who had been first a French Calvinist and who had later received ordination in the Church of England, was submitted to Rome. At the command of Pope Innocent XI, a full investigation was undertaken by a commission under the presidency of Cardinal Casanata. The decision of the Holy Office, based on a searching examination of the Anglican ordinal and of the circumstances of its origin in the reign of Edward VI, was that it was invalid as a sacramental rite and that the succession of Anglican orders had been null from the beginning. Twenty years later, another thorough inquiry was undertaken at Rome into the case of John Gordon, convert Anglican Bishop of Galloway, Ireland before pronouncing their verdict, which they did at a solemn session in 1704 in the presence of Pope Clement XI. The cardinals of the Holy Office sought a new, the opinion of leading theologians in Rome, Parish and Douai, and also took careful 
cognizance of the facts and theological arguments brought forward in the investigation of 1684 to 85. The decision of the Holy See was that none of the orders Gordon had received were valid. It added that since he had not even received the sacrament of confirmation, i.e., because there was no true bishops to confirm him. He was to be confirmed afresh before he could receive any Catholic orders. This last point is significant in showing that the Roman judgment extended to the whole succession of Anglican Episcopal orders, the decision was as before based on an objective examination of the origin and nature of Edwardine Ordinal. It was independent of the somewhat involved circumstances of Gordon's personal background nor did it rely upon the debatable assertions contained in his petition to Rome. The Gordon case became a classic precedent for the acts of the Holy See. It is important to notice, writes Leo XIII, that this papal decision applies in general, to all Anglican ordinations. For although it refers to a particular case, yet the ground upon which it was based was not particular. This ground was the defect of form, a defect from which all Anglican ordinations suffer equally. And therefore, Whenever similar cases have subsequently come up for judgment, this decree of Clement the Eleventh has been quoted every time. In 1875, another Holy Office inquiry, undertaken at the request of Cardinal Manning, in view of some misunderstandings caused by a book by an English writer, once more found the Anglican ordinal defective as a sacramental rite. Francelin, who was the theologian consulter, put his finger on the vital point. It is not a matter of asking what the form now used could perhaps signify. He wrote, the question to be asked is why and how the Catholic form of ordination and the whole liturgy likewise was substantially altered by the first deformers in the reign of Edward VI into an altogether different rite with another and opposed meaning and then reintroduced under Elizabeth with the same alterations and on the same grounds. The Catholic rite was repudiated and a new one adopted in accordance with a publicly professed heresy with the aim of deleting from the right all that signified the peace priestly power which is the power of consecrating and offering 
the sacrifice of the New Testament, since the sacraments of the new law are visible, efficacious signs. They effect what they signify. And so it is absurd to say that a visible rite in which is excluded the signification of the priestly power which ought to be conferred can be a sacrament for the conferring of that power. This was in fact the same argument which had been used in the Holy See investigations two centuries earlier and it was the same decisive argument that was to be used by Pope Leo the 13th in his final judgment 21 years later that's the end of that chapter and I'm sitting very uncomfortably I'm going to have to move my leg um, I might have to move what I'm sitting on a bit because it hurts I can't take the pain in my leg <laughs> oh dear I might unplug everything if I'm not too careful here there's wires everywhere oh dear I don't know what to do I'm going to have to move. It's so painful. My knee, I hope you can still hear me. Pain in my knee. It's hard. getting old. <laughs> getting old. The arthritis is kicking in badly. I've gone backwards a bit. I just can't get nearer the, the loudspeaker, the recorder. But I have to adjust the leg. <sighs> So I'm now going to begin on five now. The bull, Apostolicae Curae of 1896. A, the preliminary discussions and the final decision of Pope Leo XIII. With the growth of the Anglo-Catholic party in the Church of England in the 19th century, the question of Anglican orders came more and more into prominence. Between 1892 and 1896, there was renewed discussion of it both in England and on the continent and hopes were expressed in some quarters that the Holy See might reconsider the church's fixed practice of treating Anglican orders as invalid the warm-hearted Abbe Fernand Portal, who was a close friend of Lord Halifax, the leading Anglo-Catholic layman, championed the Anglican claims and enlisted the sympathetic interest of a number of eminent Catholic ecclesiastics, including Dutch Esne, Gasparri, Budinhon, and even Cardinal Rampolla, the Papal Secretary of State. Pope Leo himself welcomed the idea of a thorough and impartial reinvestigation of the whole question. A preliminary commission of inquiry was set up in Rome in the spring of 1896 under the presidency of Cardinal Mazella. Several of the consultors chosen were men known to be favourable to the Anglican case 
and these were provided with further information and advice by two Anglo-Catholic divines, Puller and Lacey, who were in Rome for that purpose. The reports of these proceedings and all the other relevant data were then presented to the Pope and to the Commission of Cardinals of the Holy Office appointed by him to judge the question. For six weeks, every aspect of the question was exhaustively re-examined by the Commission of Cardinals. Finally, in a plenary session held in the Pope's presence in the throne room of the Vatican on Thursday, 16th of July. It's my second wedding anniversary, that, but 2003. 16th of July, 1896. They gave their unanimous verdict. It was that the invalidity of Anglican orders had previously been decided by the Holy See. After full and proper inquiry, and that the recent reinvestigation had served to vindicate this decision as just and wise. The Pope himself had reached the same conclusion after long study of the evidence. After further prayer and reflection, he decided that it was his duty to pronounce a public and authoritative judgment. This he did in a special apostolic constitution of 13th of September 1896, of which the opening words were Apostolic Curae, after setting out the relevant historical facts and theological reasons, he gave his decision in these terms. Wherefore, adhering entirely to the decrees of the pontiffs, our predecessors on this subject, and fully ratifying and renewing them by our own authority, on our own initiative, and with certain knowledge, we pronounce and declare that ordinations performed according to the Anglican rite have been and are completely null and void. In the preliminary historical section of the bull, Pope Leo shows the importance of the previous decisions and practice of the Church. It is the following section of the bull stating the theological reasons for the invalidity of Anglican ordinations, defect of form and an accessory defect of intention that has been most widely misunderstood. The essential points of the Pope's argument interpreted in the light of the theological principles which it presupposed must now be summarised. B. The defect of form. The Pope begins by pointing out that a valid sacramental rite must signify outward, outwardly what it effects inwardly. In the sacrament of holy order, it is primarily the form that must convey the essential signification, that is, the spoken words which combine with the matter, 
hear the laying on of hands by the bishop to determine the sacramental meaning of what is to be done. Now what the sacrament of order does principally and essentially is to confer the priestly power of consecrating the true body and blood of Jesus Christ and of offering true sacrifice in the Eucharist. Thus, for an ordination rite to be valid, the true body and blood of Jesus Christ and of offering true sacrifice in the Eucharist, thus for an ordination rite to be valid, the ritual form must sufficiently signify in one way or another the bestowal of this priestly power. Pope Leo's decisive theological objection against the rite used for Anglican ordination is that it in no way conveys this essential sacramental signification and indeed it cannot because it equivalently signifies the contrary since this is the crux of the whole question it is well to concentrate attention on the Pope's treatment of it some Catholic authors held the opinion that for an ordination right to be valid, the order to be conferred, or at least its essential grace and power, must be expressly mentioned in the actual wording of the operative formula. But, as Pope Leo was well aware, this restrictive opinion was held only by a minority with a wider and more profound understanding of the theology of the sacramental sign leading theologians and canonists of the time including Gaspari and Le Mucuru had pointed out that the sacramental signification of an ordination rite is not necessarily limited to one phase, phrase or formula, but can be clearly conveyed from many different parts of the rite. These other parts could thus contribute either individually or in combination to determining the sacramental meaning of the operative formula in an unambiguous um, sense. Thus the wording of an ordination form, even if not specifically determinate in itself, can be given the required determination from its setting, ex adjunctitus that is, from the other prayers and actions of the rite, or even from the connotations of the ceremony as a whole in the religious context of the age, the so-called sacramentary of Serapion brought to light in 1898, may be taken as a case in point. The principle of determination ex adiunctis was commonly accepted in the schools of Catholic theology at the time of Apostolicae Curae and had been given full weight in the Roman inquiry of 1896. It was urged as a plea in defence of the Anglican ordination forms by those who were acting as a counsel for the Anglo-Catholic case. Even if not sufficiently specific in themselves, it was suggested those forms might acquire the necessary specification ex adiunctis, that is, from the other accompanying prayers, 
exhortations and rubrics of the ordinal, or even from the printed preface. At several points in the respective ordination ceremonies, there is either express mention or equivalent allusion to the offices of priest and bishop. Could it not be argued that these references supply the required sacramental significance either by themselves or at least in conjunction with the other elements of the rite? In Apostolicae Curae, the Pope takes judicious account of the two alternative opinions among Catholic theologians. He begins with implied allusion to the first opinion by pointing out that the words receive the Holy Ghost, etc., which were usually claimed as the operative forms in the Edwardian ordinal, certainly did not contain at any rate until amended in 1662, any express mention of the order to be conferred or of the essential sacerdotal power. Thus, if the more restrictive opinion held by some Catholic authors is followed, those forms were obviously defective, at least during the vital first century of the Church of England's history, and consequently the succession of orders was extinguished. Many authors have taken these introductory and hypothetical remarks of the Pope in isolation from what follows and have mistakenly supposed that they contain his own final argument against the Anglican ordination forms. But although he gives preliminary consideration to the narrower opinion, Leo XIII clearly recognises that it would be inadequate to base his judgment upon it alone. He next goes on to take due account of the wider and more solidly established opinion common among Catholic theologians, which allows that a determinate significance may accrue to a sacramental form from its environment. He evidently admits this principle of determination ex adiunctus and applies it with rigorous accuracy to the case of the Anglican rite. It is here that consideration of the historical circumstances in which Cramner's ordinal was composed is seen to be of decisive importance. What Pope Paul, what, sorry, what the Pope calls the native character and spirit of the ordinal colours and determines its total meaning. It originated as an instrument of the Reformation doctrine of the Christian ministry. Hence, with its significant doctrine of the Christian ministry, hence with its significant alterations and omissions, it connotes the rejection of the Catholic consecrating and sacrificing priesthood. The preface printed at the beginning of the ordinal declaring an intent to continue the apostolic ministry of bishops, priests and deacons in no way alters this objective anti-sacerdotal significance of the rite. It is impossible, as the Pope points out, for a form to be suitable and sufficient for a sacrament 
when it suppresses that which it ought distinctly to signify. The appeal then to determination ex adiunctus, far from strengthening the case for the Edwardine ordinal, is fatal to it. When the right is judged in its total context, historical and theological, it is plain that none of the formulas it contains, even when they are neutral or ambiguous in themselves, and even those which expressly include the words priest or bishop, can serve to convey the essential sacramental signification required for transmitting the Catholic priesthood. Leo the Thirteenth elaborates this cardinal argument in the following words. For a just and adequate appraisal of the Anglican ordinal, it is above all important, besides considering what has been said about some of its parts, rightly to appreciate the circumstances in which it originated and was publicly instituted, a detailed account would be tedious as well as unnecessary. The history of the period tells us clearly enough what were the sentiments of the authors of the ordinal towards the Catholic Church, who were the heterodox associates whose help they invoked to what end they directed their designs. They knew only too well the intimate bond which unites faith and worship, lex credendi and lex supplancandi. And so under the pretext of restoring the order of the liturgy to its primitive form, they corrupted it in many ways to bring it into accord with the errors of the innovators. Hence, not only is there in the whole ordinal no clear mention of sacrifice, of consecration, of priesthood, of the power to consecrate and offer sacrifice, but as we have already indicated, every trace of these and similar things remaining in such prayers of the Catholic rite as were not completely rejected was purposely removed and obliterated. The native character and spirit of the ordinal, as one may call it, is thus objectively evident. Moreover, incapable as it was of conferring valid orders by reason of its original defectiveness and remaining as it did in that condition, there was no prospect that with the passage of time it would become capable of conferring them. It was in vain that from the time of Charles I some men attempted to admit some notion of sacrifice and priesthood and that later on certain additions were made to the ordinal and equally vain is the contention of a relatively small and recently formed section of Anglicans that the said ordinal can be made to bear a sound and orthodox sense. These attempts, we say, were and are fruitless for the reason, moreover, that even though some words in the Anglican ordinal, as it now stands, may present the possibility of ambiguity, they cannot bear the same sense as they have in a Catholic rite. For as we have seen, when once a new rite has been introduced, 
denying or corrupting the sacrament of order and repudiating any notion whatsoever of consecration and sacrifice. Then, the formula, receive the Holy Ghost. That is the Spirit, who is infused into the soul with the grace of the sacrament, is deprived of its force. Nor have the words for the office and work of a priest or bishop, etc., any longer their validity being now mere names voided of the reality which Christ instituted. The decisive factor then has been from the beginning the native character and spirit of the ordinal or the objective purport stamped on it by the circumstances of its origin is because of this factor that the Catholic Church has always judged the Anglican rite to be defective in form, that is, in sacramental signification. Many authors, Catholics as well as non-Catholics, while rightly appreciating the importance that the Pope attaches to this factor, have unwarily fallen into the habit of calling it an intention. And this has been the root of much terminological confusion. The term intention has a strict technical sense in sacramental theology. And never once in the bull does Leo XIII use it when treating the of the defect form, of the defect of form, to avoid what seems to be otherwise inevitable, misunderstanding, it would be well if in future all followed his example on this point when discussing the meaning of his bull. Anglican critics of apostle. Apostolicae Curae spend much effort and indignation in justifying the intention of the right or the intention of the Church of England or the intention of the ordinal or the intention of its preface but their very use of those misleading expressions shows that they have mistaken the Pope's meaning. Failure to keep distinct on the one hand the theological principles which apply to sacramental form and on the other the principles which apply to sacramental intention in the proper sense has been a chief source of misunderstanding in this controversy. Point C. The defect of intention. It is clear then that Pope Leo's paramount decision for judging all Anglican ordinations invalid is the original and abiding defect of sacramental signification in the English ordinal. It is a reason which is fundamentally simple and conclusive. Once the key principle has been grasped, Almost the whole of the doctrinal exposition of the bull is accordingly devoted to showing the decisive importance of this defect of form. Then as a rider to this main argument, Leo XIII mentions briefly an additional and distinct reason 
for judging Anglican orders invalid, defect of ministerial intention. He gives this due weight as a supplementary consideration, but does not elaborate it. The proof of the defect of intention, though strictly cogent, is not easily grasped by the non-theologian, for it involves close reasoning about canon oh, sorry, canonical principles. If the ordinary inquirer finds this proof too technical for him or her to follow, he may pass it over as a matter of secondary consequence. It is enough to appreciate the force of the Pope's central argument concerning the primary defect of form, which is decisive by itself. The theologian, however, must probe more deeply. Pope Leo's brief reference to the subject of intention calls for accurate interpretation since it has been made a chief source of misunderstanding about the bull's meaning. With the intrinsic defect of form in Anglican ordinations, the Pope declares has been combined a defect of intention. This he explains as follows. The church does not pass judgment on the mind or intention in as much as it is something directly interior, but in so far as it is externally manifested, she is bound to judge of it. Now, if in order to perform and administer a sacrament, a person has seriously and correctly used the the due matter and form, he is for that very reason presumed to have intended to do what the church does. This principle is the basis of the doctrine that a sacrament is valid even if it is conferred by a heretic or an unbaptized person, provided the Catholic rite is used. But if, on the contrary, the rite is changed with the manifest purpose of introducing another rite which is not accepted by the Church and of repudiating that which, in fact, the Church does and which, by Christ's institution, belongs to the nature of the sacrament, then it is evident that there is not merely an absence of necessary sacramental intention, but indeed that an intention is present, which is contrary to and incompatible with the sacrament. Leo XIII is here using the term intention in the fixed technical sense it bears in Catholic sacramental theology, namely, to refer solely to the ministerial intention of the person who actually administers a sacrament. For a valid sacrament, the Church requires, in addition to the essential form and matter, a due intention in the minister who performs the right. The Council of Trent defined that the minister must intend at least to do what the church does. It is true that this ministerial intention may be vague and minimal, 
and may be presumed sufficient even in one who does not understand or believe the church's sacramental doctrine provided he continues to use the accustomed matter and form of the church's sacrament. In such a case, the church normally presumes that he has merely theoretical error in his intellect, which does not affect his will in such a way as to nullify his general intention of doing what Christ or his church requires. If, however, the minister gives some clear indication when performing the rite, not merely of theoretical error, but of a deliberate act of will, directed against something which is, whether he realises or not, essential to Christ's sacrament, then the church can judge with cano canonical certainty that his positive anti-sacramental intention necessarily vitiates and nullifies his whole ministerial intention. This principle of positive contrary intention, solidly established in Catholic theology and canonical practice, must be presupposed for a fuller understanding of the passage in the bull. It need not be thought that the apostolicae curae declared defective, the intention of all who have administered the Anglican ordination right, even to our own day, what is relevant here is the personal intention of those who performed the early Anglican ordinations in the 16th century in particular. It was the intention of those who acted as ministers in the Episcopal consecration in 1559 of Matthew Parker, first Archbishop of Canterbury, in the new Elizabethan hierarchy that was given special attention in the Roman Inquiry of 1896, since it was from Parker that the whole subsequent succession of Anglican orders derived. Bishop Barlow and his assistants openly professed adherents of the Reformation doctrines, agreed to the change of the ordination rite for the institution of Parker, deliberately reintroducing Cranmer's ordinal with its known anti-sacerdotal significance in substitution for the Catholic pontifical which had been restored to use in Mary's reign. It was that manifest act in those circumstances that provided evidence sufficient for the Holy See to judge that they had, when performing the right, not merely con Committant heresy in the intellect, but positive act of will directed against the Catholic sacerdotal power by thus positively repudiating something which, to use Pope Leo's words, 
by Christ's institution belongs to the nature of the sacrament, they manifest it, an intention, contrary to and incompatible with the sacrament. In Parker's consecration, therefore, to the permanent and objective defect of form, there was added a defect of ministerial intention. D. Point D. The dogmatic and canonical force of the Holy See's decision. It should be remembered that the judgment of the Catholic Church on Anglican orders was expressed not only by the special apostolic constitution of Pope Leo XIII, but also by several earlier authoritative decisions and has been confirmed by the constant practice of the Church through four centuries of unconditionally reordaining converts from the Anglican ministry, as well as the bulls of Julius III and Paul IV in the 16th century. There was the investigation under Innocent XI in 1684, the solemn judgment of Clement XI in the Gordon case in 1704, and the Holy Office decision of 1875 under Pius XI. Clearly, Apostolicae Curiae is more than a purely disciplinary decision. It contains important doctrinal teaching about the essentials of the Sacrament of Orders, set forth by at least the ordinary magisterial authority of the Church, and as such demands the respectful assent of Catholics. The theological arguments it contains, which are in any case conclusive by themselves, receive an added sanction from this papal authority. Theologians have also given attention to the practical force of apostolicae curae when the Pope uses his apostolic authority to determine the validity or invalidity of a sacramental rite, he can be said to exercise a practical infallibility, since in such a case his authoritative decree gives effective force to what it declares. Thus, since 1896, there has been an added source of certainty about the continuing invalidity of the Anglican ordinal. Some Catholic authors have raised the question whether Pope Leo's decision was an infallible ex cathedra pronouncement in the technical sense. Difference of opinion on this point is permissible, but that in no way weakens the certainty of the Church's judgment on Anglican orders, as explained above, a certainty which rests upon the unalterable truths of theology and history and which is guaranteed by repeated decisions of the Holy See and by the age-long sacramental practice of the Church. Moreover, settling the question, the Pope was not only pronouncing on a matter which concerns the Church's worldwide mission, but he was also exercising his office as guardian of the Church's sacraments.
an office which in Catholic belief, belief has been committed by Christ to his vicar on earth and which must include the power to decide with final certainty what does and does not constitute a true sacramental rite. Doctrinal interpretation of the facts of theology and history, even when not directly included in the content of revelation, may yet come within the scope of what is called the secondary object of papal infallibility. For these reasons, many Catholic theologians hold that the decision of apostolic curae was delivered with infallible authority. Apostolic curae is in any case final and binding for Catholics. In an official letter to the Cardinal Archbishop of Paris in November 1896, Leo XIII declared, It was our purpose to deliver final judgment and to settle completely that most important question of Anglican ordinations. All Catholics should receive our decision with the utmost respect as being perpetually fixed, ratified and irrevocable. For instance, the eminent canonist Capella writes, It is a case of an infallible judgment delivered ex cathedra so that there can be no doubt at all of the nullity nullity of Anglican ordinations, Rome 1935. V1, so that's six, developments since 1896. Since 1896, controversy about Anglican orders has continued and there is an extensive literature on the subject. In 1897, an official answer of the Archbishops of England to Pope Leo XIII was published, drafted by Bishop Wordsworth of Salisbury. He, like almost all Anglican critics of Apostolicae Curae, ever since failed to interpret accurately its compressed technical language, even today. Hardly any of the objections brought against the bull are to the point. There have been some Catholic writers too who have not clearly appreciated the precise theological issues. The attitude of the Eastern Orthodox churches, which for long regarded Anglican orders as null, has varied in recent years. Some Orthodox churches are now prepared to treat Anglican orders as on the same footing as Roman Catholic orders. Others, however, still refuse to recognise in the Anglican rite anything which could avail for the sacrament of order, holy orders they mean. The Old Catholics, a small schismatical group, with members in Holland and elsewhere, some of whose theologians reported in 1894 against the validity of Anglican orders, have now recognised those orders and are in intercommunion with the Church of England. A few Anglican clergymen have sought to obtain ordination privately at the hands of Episcopi Vagantes, ecclesiasticus of irregular position, who claim 
who have received the apostolic succession of episcopal orders through some of the lesser eastern rites or similar sources. The action of these eccentrics is not approved by the Anglican Church, which gives no countenance to any such clandestine ordinations. In any case, the credentials of those freelance bishops, the manner in which their ordination rites are performed, and even the written records relating to them are usually open to serious question. Somewhat different is the case of the Dutch Old Catholic bishops, who were officially asked by the Church of England to participate as co-consecrators in Anglican Episcopal ordinations on a number of occasions in recent years. Those Dutch prelates may be presumed to have been validly consecrated according to Catholic usage and to have intended to confer true orders. Accordingly, some have thought that from this source, a stream of valid orders has been introduced into the Anglican Church, judged by the principles of Catholic theology. However, the Episcopal consecrations performed on those occasions cannot be considered valid since the Anglican ordinal, with its permanent defect of sacramental signification, was employed for the ceremony as usual. There was one variation from the normal procedure according to the Anglican rubrics. Only the presiding archbishop pronounces the form and the assistant bishops merely lay hands on the candidate in silence. But it is related that on those occasions the assisting old Catholic prelates not only imposed hands but also pronounced the words Asipe Spiritum Sanctum, receive the Holy Spirit. These unspecific words by themselves would not suffice to confer the Catholic sacrament of order. They could only suffice only if the due signification of the high priesthood were supplied to them from the ritual context. Here the very contrary occurred. However orthodox may have been the subjective intention of those old Catholic prelates, the formula they used insufficiently determinate in itself was outwardly and objectively determined to a defective sense by the ritual setting in which it was pronounced. The original anti-sacerdotal significance of the ordinal authoritatively declared by the Holy See in 1896 to be permanently attached to it remained decisive in those particular Anglican ordinations as in all others. In any case, even if the Anglican bishops who were consecrated on these occasions, had received valid Episcopal orders, this would not mean that the ordinations they themselves later carried out would be valid, since for such ordinations they invariably follow the wording and rubrics of the Anglican ordinal with its abiding defect of sacramental signification. In conclusion, it must be stressed again that although the Catholic Church does not recognise the Anglican ministry 
as sacramental, her attitude to all Anglicans is one of goodwill and charity, and she longs to welcome them into her unity. She wants an end to the polemical bitterness of the past and seeks only to follow the truth in a spirit of charity. Ephesians 4 verse 15 She bids her children in their dealings with their separated fellow Christians to put aside all hardness, unkindness and self-satisfaction and to approach them with sympathy, humility and love. Catholics respect the religious sincerity of their Anglican brethren and have no thought of denying the reality of their spiritual life or of the divine favours they have been granted on the occasion of their acts of reverent worship. When devout souls reverently commemorating the Lord's Supper come seeking grace from what they sincerely suppose to be a valid sacrament, we may be confident that God does not send them away empty. He is not bound by his sacraments, though we are. In the story of this long and distressing controversy, Catholics find special reason to pray that their separated Anglican brethren may at last find their way to the fullness of truth and the channels of sacramental grace in the life of Christ's one church. Thank you so much for listening. That's gone on for just over two hours. The Catholic Church and Anglican orders. I hope you found that educational and bless you all if you've got to the end of that. God bless you and thank you very much. I'm wishing you a blessed and holy week. God bless.